say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. Hello, everybody, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and I am so excited to be with you. You're watching us now on Facebook Live on andfb.com. That's right, it's andfb.com. You can also find us on TuneIn Radio. You can also find us on Spotify and iTunes and all sorts of other places to hear this show, A New Direction, where what we try to do is help people find a new direction in their life, in their careers, and in their business. And I am so excited, and I say that every week, I'm so excited because of the guests I have on the show, but I'm really, really excited, again, because it seems like the guests just continue to get better and better and better. And uh, we will be uh, talking to Eric Wright, who's a co-author of the book, Dogs Don't Bark at Parked Cars. Hold on, hold on, I know before you start, you know, questioning, Jay, what does this have to do with a new direction for me? I'm telling you, we're going to talk about leadership, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, and it's just one of the coolest books because of the way they've they've creatively done the book. And, and we're going to talk to Eric in a second. But I do this every week that we're together and every single time we're together. And that is I check in with you on the four areas of your life. And I check in with you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you? 1 being it's just miserable. 10 being it just can't get any better, Jay. So let's talk about that physically. Where are you right now as you're listening to the show? Where are you physically? Are you taking care of your body? Are you eating the right things? Are you working out? Are you taking those extra walks? Are you doing the right things for your heart and your body to take care of yourself? Because, folks, here's what I know as somebody who's an avid gym uh, person who just loves to work out. I know that gym going to the gym is part of it, but eating right is also part of it. And it can't be a diet because here's the thing about diets. You're going to get off your diet. But if you make it a lifestyle, then it becomes a change. And I know you can't do all of that all at once. Folks, I had to do it one small baby step at a time to create that. And, you know, the goal here, whenever we talk about, you know, where you on a scale of one to 10, isn't about getting from a one to a 10. You know, if you're a three, how are you going to get to a four? If you're a six, can you get to a seven? So where are you at physically? What are you doing? And then what can you do to improve that? And then mentally on that scale of one to 10, where are you at? And, and you say, well, what do you mean mentally? I mean, what are you doing filling yourself with knowledge? Are you reading? Are you trying to maybe learn a new language to open up the other sides of your brain? Are you creating and using the right side of your brain, creating something new? Or maybe, you know, you want to work on your logic skills. And yes, folks, even if you're older, you can still work on your logic skills and your math skills and those type of things. And what are you doing to exercise both sides of your brain? Because as we expand in knowledge, right, it just allows our brain to do so many things and I don't want to get into the physiology of it but I can tell you that we're just opening up new nerve endings and synaptic connections inside of our brain that allow us to expand our brain and then third where are you at emotionally you know one of the things that we talk about and in the book matter of fact that we're going to talk about today they talk about EQ an emotional quotient right and I talk about emotional intelligence quite frequently on the show and I want to know, where is your emotional quotient? Where is your emotional intelligence? Are you able to control your emotions, right? Do the little things hack you off? Are you able to control them? Are you able to connect and understand other people's emotions? Or are you so busy worrying about you that you can't connect with somebody else and emotionally connect with them? I don't care what you do. This, is a, this isn't just a life skill. This is a business skill. This is a career skill. If you can start to read other people's emotions and you can start to emote with them and connect with them, it just makes you better. And folks, we have to be intentional with our emotions. Our emotions don't have to control us. We have to learn how to control our emotions. And that's part of our emotional intelligence and emotional quotient. So if you're a three, if you're feeling like, Jay, I just you know, don't emotionally have it together, what can you do to get to a four? You know, maybe maybe it's it's a matter of you going, hold it, I just need to kind of re-self-evaluate myself and move on. And then finally, the fourth area, and uh, equally important, is your spiritual side. On a scale of one to ten, where, one to ten, where are you spiritually? And a lot of people, I say this every week, I know a lot of people go, well, I don't believe in God. I didn't say that you had to believe in God, but if you do, you know, where are you in that relationship? Because, but a lot of people are connected to so many things outside of themselves 
And that's what we're talking about spiritually here. You know, some people connect themselves to nature. Some people even have faith in themselves, right? Making themselves their own God. Okay, I'm not sure how that's going to work out for you. But I do know this. I do know this for sure. I do know that we believe in something that's generally outside of ourselves that we have faith in. And however you are connected there, how are you doing in that in that part of your life? And remember, these four areas are like the four legs of a chair, right? If they're unequal, you're sitting on a crooked chair. If they're too low, you're sitting on a really low chair. And the goal is to get the chair at the right height, which is a perfect 10. And so that leads me that that leads me and it's a journey folks by the way it's 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 not a destination you're going to be constantly working and you're going to be floating up and down but i want to encourage you today to go ahead and do the best you can getting one more step closer and that leads me to this amazing book that we're about to and and also this amazing author and that i want to introduce to you because uh I, I, I really fell in love with this book. I wasn't sure when I first read the title, and then I was like, I started reading the book, and I went, oh my gosh, this is a great, great <laughs> book. Uh, first of all, let me introduce you to the book a little bit. So, uh, and I get these write-ups. You have to understand, and you folks are watching me live, and you know I've got all these computers and stuff in front of me. So, uh, the big idea. The, the roadmap guiding leaders through the tangled interchanges of the business world is undergoing a complete recalibration as it adapts to the era of hyper change. The effective trailblazer in this area of accelerated change must develop an internal compass that guides their interpersonal relationships. And you know how I feel about interpersonal relationships and enables them to keep their teams moving forward in the direction they want to go. Right. I mean, that it, I, I can't sum that up any better. So what? Well, the research shows that today's organizations need a new set of rules if they're going to effectively steer the changing workforce. Before, a leader's ability and talent were the focus, but now leaders need less tangible qualities such as engendering trust, harnessing synergy. I love that word synergy. And we're going to talk about it and clarifying a vision. So our, our guest, Eric Wright and Jeff Pearsall, who, who's the founder and CEO of CSB Marketing, uh, and Eric Wright, who's president of publishing at CSB Marketing, are authors of this new book that came out in January entitled Dogs Don't Bark at Park Cars, Your GPS in the Era of Hyperchange. And so we're going to talk to him, but let me give you a little bit of Eric. Eric Wright is president of the publishing at SCB Marketing, an innovative leader, dynamic speaker. And you know, as somebody who belongs to the National Speakers Association folks, you know how I feel about my fellow speakers. I know that I get people who are doing conferences and you guys have influence. I'm telling you, hire this guy, right? Hire him. He's worth the hire. <laughs> All right. He's also a published author. And you know me as a published author. I love my fellow published authors by his book. And we'll, I'll be encouraging you to do that, too, as well. He has taught leadership and management seminars on four continents, not three, not two, four continents, and has served on a variety of economic development and visioning councils and has authored hundreds of articles and three books. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show. And Eric, welcome to A New Direction. Jay, thank you so much. And I have to say, I probably, like yourself, have the opportunity to do a lot of radio shows um, from folks all over the country. That was one of the most engaging introductions to a show I have ever heard. Um, that very simple checkup that you did, uh, I think, would help anybody kind of recalibrate where they're at and, and what their daily priorities are. So, uh, boy, kudos to you. That, that's you. very well done. I, I enjoyed it myself. I was, I was taking some notes down, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those things where I, I learned this, actually, uh, in a small group at my church years ago, um, mm. probably some 20 years ago. And uh -huh. I have always felt that it was really a good thing. And if I'm consulting a company, and, and even myself, I always want people to check in. Where are you? Because I know that wherever we're the weakest, whatever the weakest, weakest link is, that's mm -hmm. where we're probably going to end up struggling. And, and we're, we're going to carry that into our workplace. We're going to try to carry it into our next job or a career or a marriage or a family. Uh, and I know that all four of those areas, because I firmly believe that we're four-part people, and I have mm -hmm. made that extraordinarily clear that we are. And so I want people to really 
connect with themselves and I, and every and I say the same exact things every week. Everybody knows when I whenever I do this show, they I say it all the time, and I know people will say to me things like. Oh really? Are we going to have to check in with ourselves again? And then by the end of all four, they they go, they go, yeah, yeah. I'm no, I, 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 that's the brilliance of it, is that uh, well, yeah, it's like stepping on the scale. You've got to do that, you know, on a regular basis, you know, to find out where you are and where you want to go. Honestly, the other thing you said that I really appreciated, you said, well, if if today I'm at a four, don't worry about how to get to 10 worry about how to get to five right. or don't even worry about it but what what are the steps that i can take to move myself from a four to a five from a five to a six because that's how all lasting progress is made uh, you you alluded to diet and you're so right um you know diets don't work lifestyle changes work changing our mindsets works um and so no this is this is fascinating and, and it, it's interesting i I mentioned to you uh, before we went live that uh, that I was a pastor over 25 years, um, planted three different churches, and 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 they they did well, and uh, uh, so glad to hear that that's part of your paradigm, part of your journey, part of what helped shape you. It certainly it shapes who I am and who Jeff Pierce, my business partner, is. He was actually one of my parishioners, and uh, he had come to me and asked me to help him articulate the values for his company. At the time, he was a CEO of a pretty large uh, nutraceutical company, um, and then I did some speaking engagements with him, and then, you know, over time, you know, we got more involved in this new venture he was doing and and now uh, we're partners together in business so well that's awesome so i and I, I tell people all the time this show is really here's how i vision the show we're sitting at a kitchen we're sitting around the kitchen because you know that's where if you have a party that's where most people gather is the kitchen because there's yep. food right and usually some beverages involved and and we're just sitting there and here we are two two guys who are sitting at and it could be a gal but two of us are just sitting there and we're just talking and that's what the show is this we're just chatting about your book and and you know where you got your insights and and you know why you believe what you believe and and you know why this is important to you so i i want you to feel at home in my kitchen here okay. and and a new direction is literally about helping people find a new direction as i stated earlier in their life or their career and their business and so i want you to feel that you have the carte blanche if you feel that you have something that can help people take one small baby step into finding a new direction in whatever they are in their lives or career or business that you have that you you you're open to doing that because i want you to have that as well <laughs> well thank you and and you know honestly jay i'll just dive in there because i again i like the name of your show uh, because life is all about change, and and I realize that sometimes uh, we get into ruts or we face obstacles that we just don't feel like we can scale. But all change, all new directions, you know, it begins with changing your mind. Um, I realize a lot of the audience here maybe does not have a Christian worldview or they don't have a uh, any kind of biblical background or education. Uh, but you and I both know that when John the Baptist, who was the predecessor of Jesus, and Jesus came on the scene, they both had this central theme, and it was repent. Now, most of us interpret that word to mean stop doing bad things, you know, um, but that's not what the word means. The word means change your mind. Right. Because everything that John wanted to set people up for, everything that Jesus was setting people up for, involved people just changing their minds and therefore embracing new perspectives, embracing new lifestyles, embracing those things that are going to help you become the person that you dreamed you could be and you should be. 
and uh, and so that that's where it all begins. It it begins with a different sort of mindset, uh, a mindset that that's going to shape how we interpret uh, both the good things that happen to us and the bad things that happen to us, and and that mindset's also going to shape your emotional responses. You alluded to emotional responses uh, earlier. Um, you know, if you, it's hard to work on changing your emotions, but if you change your mindsets, oftentimes the result of that is that your emotions begin to line up with your mindset. <laughs> they always do. Right. Um, so, you know, that's, I, I just, I applaud the, uh, the direction that you're trying to take people in because I think for everyone, it's the most uh, important issue that we're all discussing and, and, and trying to arrive at. Well, and I, thank you so much. That's really, that's really kind of you. And I thought, and I, but I, I thought that was the thing, you know, I read the book and, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting, matter of fact, I'm sitting reviewing notes, uh, as I'm on the bike bicycle with a bad ankle and I, I'm, I'm going through the notes of your book and I bought the Kindle version. And, and by the way, folks, if you're just tuning into us and I know that some of you are, I am talking with co-author of the book, dogs don't bark at parked cars. And his name is Eric Wright. And and the, the full title is Dogs Don't Bark at Parked Cars, Your GPS in an Era of Hyper Change. And uh, by the way, you can get it at Amazon. It's available Kindle and paperback. And I really suggest that you pick up the book. And, and by the way, I don't care what level you are in business or whether you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or should you be an entrepreneur. This book is for everyone. There's not, there's not a person that cannot read this book and go, well, Okay, that's not for me. No, it is for you. And not only that, <laughs> and not only is that for you, let me just say something else here about this book. I am one who writes my books in a very conversational tone. Matter of fact, I've been criticized because I write very con- in a conversational style. This book is done in exactly the same way. It's conversational. You feel like Eric is right there with you and he's just... He's just talking with you just as we're talking together right now. I'm telling you, you're going to enjoy this read because this is, this is a great read and it's a fun read. What I love about the book, and, 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 and I don't want to give too much of it away because I want people to purchase the book, but what I love about the book, every chapter starts with something about a dog. <laughs> right? Yes. I mean, it's, it, I mean every, yes, every, yes. every chapter starts with something about a dog. And I thought... Well, this is creative because I'm a dog person. My wife and I are dog people. Okay. And right. so we, we love dogs. And every chapter starts with something that has to relate to a dog. And I'm like going, where are you going, we're, Eric? Where are you <laughs> going with this? And, and then all of a sudden you, you turn it back and I go, oh, you're wow. <laughs> That's that's really good, and 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 so I I loved this approach. Well, say you know it really began honestly with that opening story from Jeff Pearsall's life where. Um, he was a kid growing up in rural Kentucky, and you know, at that time in, in the '60s, we all rode around on bicycles. You know, when we were kids, oh, yeah. and uh, there was one particular street where there was you know, the big mean dog that you couldn't walk down, you couldn't ride your bike down because this, this dog would come out and, and, and bark and bite and all this kind of stuff. This was before we had leash laws like we do now. And so he decided one of these days that he was going to outrun the dog. He was going to kind of teach the dog a lesson. So, so he got up ahead of steam and, and went blazing down the road and the dog took out after him, barking and yelping and everything. And he was outrunning the dog, but he looked back to look at the dog and when he did, he slowed down and the dog, you know, jumped up and bit him right on the bum, you know, <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, that when he told me that story and we were, we were talking about, you know, what this book would be, I, I, I thought, I said, Jeff, I've got to open the book with, with that particular story because it's analogous to so many things that, that whatever we're doing in life, if we're, if we're trying to make change, if we're, if we're trying to take a new direction, if we're trying to build and create something, uh, inevitably, you know, there's going to be the folks that can think of all the reasons why we couldn't or we shouldn't. Um, 
and and you got to develop you know some inner resolve and some some confidence and faith in who you are and and what your idea is and where you're going uh, because the barking dogs are going to come they don't bark at parked cars you know they only bark at moving cars and and so if your life is on a moving trajectory you're going to face this and and honestly jay where we came up with the the principles that are incorporated into the book in each chapter, it came as a result of interviewing literally hundreds of CEOs from Fortune 500 companies to startup entrepreneurs. And and after doing this for years and years, over a decade, we've done it we began to see common denominators. You begin to see common, you know, principles, almost like your four points that you were asking everybody about as you started the show. Hey, if you're, if you're hitting on all four cylinders, if you're, if you're moving these things in the right direction, your life is going to be a success. And we looked at these and we said, we, we keep finding references to these particular principles in, in each and every CEO. As I said, it didn't matter whether it was a Fortune 500 company or was a small startup. It didn't matter whether it was a woman CEO or a man CEO. It didn't matter what their age were. We found these common denominators in the ones who were truly successful. Um, not only successful in, hey, I'm achieving great bottom line results now, but we're successful over long term and we're engaged in their community and their employees like working for them. You know, all these different indicators of success that were part of our paradigm um, we found in their lives as well. Um, and so that became the sort of the incentive for the book. Um, you know, how, how do we share these these particular ideas? And of course, with Jeff's story, you know, we, we, we began to think about, you know, couching each principle, you know, in, in some way analogous to dogs and to dog training because, you know, it was, it was a sort of a common denominator as a point of reference, you know, just like yourself, that uh, that, that people love dogs and, and they love learning about their dogs. And, and quite frankly, writing the book, I, I can't tell you how much I learned just doing research, oh you know, on our on our canine buddies, you know. And so uh, that, that was a lot of fun matching these qualities to particular things uh, in animals. Um, like you talked about synergy, and and we introduced that one in in describing how uh, up in Alaska, you know, they they have these dog sleds and how they you know position the dogs on those sleds and why it works and and how they you know determine what a you know particular dog is best suited to do and everything and hey that's 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 a big part of leadership in life is uh analyzing you know what are people made for what what is it that makes them sing not just what do i need but what what were they designed to do and when they do it they find the most pleasure and they're the most successful at it and 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 they're able to do it in the long term yeah you know, so I love, that's how it sort of all came about i love that and you know i think a lot of people and and folks i, I know you're, you're watching we're talking to eric Wright, co-author of the book dogs don't bark at parked cars by the way you should get that at amazon just look it up and, and by the way not, don't get it just for you if you're a manager buy it for your team all right and, and do what my wife does my wife does this amazing thing right with her team she uh, many of you know linda craft owner of Linda Craft and Team Realtors. Uh, yes, that's a free plug on my show. Anyway, so she, uh, it's my show. I get to freely plug. Yeah, that's I'm right. Doing. That's great. <laughs> uh, but here, here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, her team, she has the entire team. It's the all the agents and the staff. And they try to read about five books a year. And I, that's encourage, great. I encourage people to do those type of things, read books, and then cover a chapter every week and make somebody responsible for the chapter and give the synopsis of the chapter. This is what she does. Because, you know what, we it's a way to expand our mind. And you remember, I talked about one of those four things earlier. You want to expand your mind. You want to expand your mental abilities. But also, 
as we learn, right, it also starts to change our thought process, which gives us more control over mm-hmm. our emotions, which is really quite oh, interesting. Right. Which is really quite interesting as well. And and so those things kind of work hand in hand. That's why, you know, the physical makes us even feel emotionally better and opens up our mind and makes us feel more free spiritually. I mean, it, it's all connected, folks. But Oh, I, it really is. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny, Jay. You know, two things. One is um, a lot of the business leaders that we had read the book that, that we originally interviewed and stuff like that, we said, hey, read the book and tell us what you think. Give us your feedback. I can't tell you how many of those said, I love the book, but I bought another copy to give to my teenage son who's graduating from high school, or I gave it to my daughter who's graduating from college and getting ready to start her career. Uh, they said, these are, these are the kind of principles that they need to have uh, incorporated into their life um, and, and a, in a foundational way. And so um, I just... We have heard that testimony over and over and over again, uh, because uh, you know part of the part of the whole thought of the book was we live in an era of hyper change. I, I don't have to tell you about that, yeah, or or anybody in the listening audience. Uh, things are changing faster today than any point in history. Uh-huh. It's been accelerating over the past two centuries, but we're almost at a, at a critical point. And how are you going to navigate those waters of hyper change? And, and the conclusion that we came to and that we have put into this book is the only way you're going to be able to navigate the waters of change is you're going to have to have an internal compass that is based on certain values and principles that don't change. You know, there, there are things that change, our, our devices change, our technology changes, our, our communication uh, ability changes, but there are certain fundamental human principles that aren't going to change. And if you can identify those and if you can build your life on those, then you're going to be able to have a compass that's always going to point to a true north and, and you're going to know where you're going and you're going to be able to wade into that very complicated experience we call decision making much easier and much better. Uh, because if, if you have a core set of principles and a decision comes up many times, that core set of principles will answer the question for you. You, you don't have to do all the due diligence and, and have to understand the technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's obvious, you know, is this right or is this wrong based on, you know, these, these core principles that guide my life. Mm-hmm. It's essential. I totally, I totally, I totally agree with you, Eric, on this. And and you know, here's the thing I I tell people like when I'm out speaking and I you know wrote this book on social media and psychology and and how to do it without spending money on marketing by creating relationships. Believe it or not, I know that we can probably talk about that at at, at because we may not completely agree on how to create relationships using social media, but I've been able to do it successfully uh, with a lot of people and have made it and made it work. And uh, for me, even though I I prefer face to face relationship building. Mm-hmm. But it's amazing how many people I've been able to create a fa- you know relationship on Facebook with and have never met them. And then I do get to finally meet them years later. And we sit down somewhere over lunch and it's like we've known each other forever. And it's, it's been. A- oh, I think. It's been- I totally think that that's that's a reality. That's that's possible. It's just like here, you and I are talking over this electronic device, and I feel like we're old friends. <laughs> um, uh, and and so so technology, you know, does have that that capacity to connect us with so many people in such a diverse audience so so quickly and and in many ways so intimately um uh, i think ever, since since man you know wrote the first book and began to spread that around the idea that that ideas could be transferred and and not only ideas but really the relationship behind those ideas you you make a connection with um that's 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 the wonder of of, of human beings and technology only uh, enhances that. As as you said, there are limitations to it, sure. um, in uh, in in marketing or or in in every sphere of life. Um, we, you know, one of the things we talked about in the book how how technology is great at uh, you know transactional 
you know, sort of relationships. I, I can book a flight. I can, you know, call an Uber, you know, up to my doorstep. You know, I can get a hotel. I mean, that's that's phenomenal, and it and it takes minutes. And and I've done it all over the world, as you probably have too. Uh, the dilemma is is when that that sort of transactional equation that we did through technology breaks down. Um, and then you want that human connection. And, and you know, whether that's via phone, whether that is, you know, Skype or, or a, an email correspondence, you want to talk to a human being. It happened to me. My wife and I were getting ready to go meet my son in Ho Chi Minh City in Saigon. He lives in Taiwan and we were going to meet there. And I had booked my flight six months earlier. And when I went to book my seat, they had canceled my reservations and hadn't contacted me. Well, at, at that point in time, you know, I wanted to talk to a human being. <laughs> I didn't have to talk to him live, but I wanted to talk to a person um, because I needed a resolution to this to this conflict I had. So I, I think that's the important thing for uh, you know people in business, especially. Well, and even and even just interpersonal relationships is to recognize technology is a great thing. Um, you can you can use it to build all kinds of relationships, but you know. Every technology has its inherent limitations, and and there's nothing that substitutes human interaction. Uh, you know, you can go to Match.com, but eventually you got to go out on a date. You know, <laughs> you got to meet the person. You know, yeah. uh, you know, is, is this chemistry really going to work? Um, and it's funny because I have met. Oh, I can't count the number of people who are happily married who met on some sort of uh, uh, internet matchmaking site, but they carried it to the next stage. You know, so that's that. I think is the the critical factor. That's awesome. We're talking. What to do you Eric. think, Jay? Oh, I well, I agree with you. I'm going to plug you here real quick, and I'm going to keep going. Back. Okay. We're talking to Eric Wright, co-author of the book "Dogs Don't Bark at Parked Cars: Your GPS in an Era of Hyper Change." Folks, great book. Get it on Amazon. It's available Kindle. It's available and also paperback as well. Uh, ask for it. It's it's a fabulous read. It's it's a read that you're going to relate to very very easily. And we're talking about relationships and, and technology and how that interacts. And one of the things I'm going to go back to, Eric, is that you there are there are certain things. And I and I try to explain this to groups when I'm talking about technology. There are certain things that are not changing. For instance, mm -hmm. human beings are not changing. Okay, I, I know yes. we think we think they're changing. The technology makes us believe that they're changing. But the fact of the matter is, the same psychology of rewards and punishments and consequences <laughs> and and how we interact and deal and our emotions have not changed. There's not been a new emotion. I'm telling you, since the beginning of time, <laughs> there is no, that is so true. Yeah, is no, there, nobody nobody has ever come up with in all the years we've been around. No one has ever said, huh, we just discovered a new emotion. No, that is not going to mm -hmm. happen, okay? And, yeah. and and by the way, we, we still succumb to those reinforcers and punishers. We, we you know, we have a tendency, I, I, okay, folks, I'm telling you, put your finger on a stove when it's hot, you won't do it again, okay? I mean, we just, mm -hmm. that's just kind of an automatic thing because the human has not changed. We want to believe that the human being is changing, but there are certain things, for instance, in this world that are unchangeable, okay? And the human being is one of them. The, mm -hmm. the, the technology, as you so brilliantly explain, is changing at such a fast pace. Uh, we used to say that the computer, the computer you bought, right, off the shelf is already obsolete. I am telling you, the, the technology that you see on Amazon is obsolete before you order it. OK, it is uh, it's already yes. it is already it's already that quickly because it is moving so fast. The app that you thought was so great is lame. OK, I'm just telling you, it's already lame <laughs> because somebody is you're right. Somebody has already made it better. <laughs> and so so I want I, I think one of the things that I love about this book, and I think you really do such a great job with is that is understanding that that human being, the human part of us has really never changed. We, we, we are what we are. And, I, and you said something else I want to go back to as part of that. 
we all have something inside of us that we are just better at than other things. There are some things we should never attempt to do. Okay. I am six, Correct. Of, right? I am six foot five inches tall and I'm 260 pounds. All right. And I, and I lift like crazy and I love it. Right. And I, and, it, and it's awesome. And, and I, I look like I'm, I look like some cross between a linebacker and a defensive end. And so, so, and, but can I tell you something? You do not want, want me to try to be a horse jockey. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, you're you're so spot on, Jay. Um, you know, we I, I think in in the book we we use the analogy of putting a defensive lineman in the quarterback role yeah. and taking the quarterback and putting him in the defensive lineman role. Um, it's a complete mismatch, and and people are that way as well. Um, I had an architect friend say to me one time, and, and I don't even remember how we got in the discussion, but he said, in architecture, form follows function. In other words, we design the building based on what we want to do with the building or in the building. If it's an office building, we design it a, f a certain way. If it is a single family home, we design it a different way. If it's a factory, we design a different way. And architecture form follows function. Then he looked at me and he said, with human beings, it's just the opposite. Mm. Our function follows our form. Mm. How we're made really determines what we're going to enjoy the most, what we're going to flourish at. It's not that we can't do it. There's a lot of things that I can learn to do, right. but I don't necessarily enjoy it. I don't flourish at it. It's not my song. And, and when you're sort of singing your song and when you're playing your song, you're in that sweet spot. And that is when you're going to be the best. That's when you're going to enjoy it the most. And, and quite frankly, as a business owner, as a business leader, if your job is putting people in their sweet spots, and even if your job is saying, hey, man, you are not in your sweet spot. Let's see if this works for you or we don't have a place for you in our organization, but I, but I see this capacity that you have and you'll just be frustrated working here. If, if that's your goal and that's how you approach it, you're going to have a business that absolutely flourishes right. because everybody's doing what they're designed to do, what they're made to do. Just like it's obvious to me that, you know, you have an inherent desire to, to speak into people's lives and to help people, you know, sort of move the dial and, and make progress in their life and, and not a flash in the pan thing, but a, a long-term success track. That's who you are. Uh, you do it with yourself and you, and you, and you want to do that with other people. Um, and, and so you're, 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 you're rightly positioned and, and everybody is the same way. Um, I can't tell you how much time we have spent within our organization helping not only the people who, who make up our organization, our, our, what we call our employees, but even our leadership and our owners say, you know, what, what do we enjoy the most doing? What are we the best at? What will we flourish at? Because ultimately we're going to be successful because we are in that place. You put a Dominican Sioux, you know, behind the center, you know, taking snaps and trying to throw passes and he's going to be a miserable failure. And you put Tom Brady in his role, you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to charge on the one yard line, you know, to, to you know, to stop a score yeah. and he's going to be craved and he's going to feel like a complete failure, but he's not a failure. He's just wrongly positioned. So that, that, that's a big part of it. We talk a lot about that in our book. Yeah, you do. And, and I loved that by the way, I, you know, as a, well, you can imagine my size, I, I kind of like football a lot. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I kind of I kind of took that as a given, but I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> so yeah. I thought maybe you were like one of my sons that played rugby or something. Yeah. No, you no, you do not want me to play rugby. Trust me, I, I, don't, I don't I don't think I have the emotional temperament to play rugby. Uh, I don't I don't like to lose, and and I, I'm a bad loser. I'm going to be the first to admit this. I am a horrible loser, and because I hate it. I, I matter of fact, uh -huh. I hate losing more than I like winning. Is that that's just crazy? But it's really true. Uh, well, at least you're honest about I it. Am, I love no, that. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a better loser, but even when my wife beats me at Monopoly, and she does often because she's in real estate, it, 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 it I almost pout. I, it's barely sad. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> 
So I want to. I want. And if it's any comfort to you, Jay, I am exactly the same way. You know, I've looked back at times. You know, being out on the tennis court. You know, or or, or or playing a game with somebody that was, you know, maybe learning, and here I am, you know, just I'm overly aggressive or something. What was I thinking? What was I doing? I don't know. I, I, know, I don't know. I do this. I do this. I, I, listen, it doesn't matter what the game is. It could be dominoes. It, 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 I know. It doesn't matter. I'm just, I, I, I'm, and I'm being honest. And and my the, my list, my listeners are watching watching this, going, going, going. What? And I'm going. Yeah, it's true. I, I have my I have my set of issues, and I, I admit it. I carry them around in my big black garbage sack of garbage that I keep with me. Every now and then, somebody pokes a hole in it, and it spills out. Uh, so I want to I want to talk about something about along the lines that we were previously talking about, and that is one of the things that I loved in your book is this idea of diversities of expression, and they're one of the um, ten qualities that you um, discuss in the book in the ten chapters. And this idea of diversity of expression, and and the reason I related to that so well is because you're not looking at me right now, but I'm wearing a cowboy hat, and 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 I'm in I'm in I'm in Python cowboy boots, and I have my belt buckles and everything, and it's just kind of the way I do what I do, and I'm comfortable in my own skin, and I have people all the time when I go consult businesses, and I'm in my cowboy hat and boots and jeans and belt buckles, and I'll go in and consult a business and. <laughs> And they'll go, well, don't you think you ought to dress up? And I'm like, well, would it make a difference? Uh, am I not? <laughs> I mean, would, would, would it make a difference? I mean, did you hire me because did you hire me because of what I wore, or did you hire me because of what's in my head? And I love this idea that there is a there is this major diversity. We all express things, we all do things, we have creative ways of doing things, and it's it's so easy for us to conform. Yes, it is. Well, we're, we're, we're under constant pressure almost from birth to do just that. And, and in some ways we learn by conforming, you know, we, we, we learn language skills. We, you know, our, our expressions, even our facial expressions, some of, some of those are learned, you know, by imitating other people, but that only goes so far, you know, eventually you've, you've got to be who you uniquely are and do what you're uniquely designed to do. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, please. No. Well, I mean, it's just, I think that's all part of it is I, I, I think we confuse, uh, sometimes I think we confuse passion for what we're created to do, right? Hmm. I, I think sometimes we can confuse those two things because I think sometimes what happens is we're passionate about something, but we probably shouldn't do it. Like, for instance, I can be extraordinarily passionate about playing basketball, but I'm terrible, okay? And... <laughs> And I mean, I am awful. And, and so I may be really passionate about it. I love it. I'm, I look, for instance, I play, I play several different instruments. Not well, but I think I'm a musician, but I'm really not uh -huh. a musician. Okay. And I'm passionate about my music. I mean, I work, I'll work through all sorts of music on my guitar, my piano, and I think I got it down, but I, as passionate as I am, nobody's going to give me a contract in Nashville. Okay. <laughs> You know, I, I think, Jay, too, what we have to recognize sometimes is what we personally get pleasure out of versus what we are uniquely positioned to work with and help other people achieve. Um, it, it's, I was an art major when I was first an undergraduate, and, and I knew that there were people that were in some of my design classes and drawing classes and painting classes because they loved art and they loved the idea of art, but they didn't necessarily have a great deal of artistic talent. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of like music, if you've got artistic talent, it doesn't matter what the medium is, you're going to excel at it. If, if it's sculpture, if it's graphic arts, it doesn't matter. If, if you got the talent, you're going to shine above all the rest. But there's a whole lot of people that will never sell a painting that love to paint. Right. You know, uh, there, it's like my dad was a, sort of an amateur ornithologist. He loves birds, but but he was never going to be a, a professor that was going to be teaching at Cornell. He just loved it. And so I think we've got to identify those things that we sort of love to do for ourselves. And then those things that we love to do that are going to help multitudes perhaps do 
what they love to do, you know. Um, and, and it's the difference between, you know, the person who is maybe a great uh, musician versus the person who's the great manager of musicians. He can have all kinds of talent as a musician, but if you don't have the right manager, nobody's ever going to know about you, you know. And, and so it's, it's that, that idea of, um, gee, I love to do this. But is it just for me or, gee, I love to do this and I can leverage this into something that can really be a benefit to me financially and possibly be a financial and vocational benefit to many, many other people. Uh, We don't have to let go of it because we can't turn it into a marketable enterprise. That's what we call a hobby, you know? Um, But if we can, if we can match those two, whether we're, we're, we're doing what we're really made to do and we love to do it and it is our vocation, then I think we found a sweet spot. That's where that word vocation, you know, in Latin means voice. We, we have a calling. We have something that we know we're meant to do and it has an inherent meaning for us and it usually has an impact on others because we do it with a level of excellence and expertise that other people benefit from. Does that make sense? Oh gosh, yes, it makes complete sense. And we're talking with Eric Wright, co-author of the book, Dogs Don't Bark at Parked Cars, available on Amazon. Uh, The second half of that subtitle is Your GPS in an Era of Hyper Change. And we're talking with him. And and Eric, do you mind staying just a few more minutes? I know that. Oh, no, not a bit. Not a bit. Are you okay? Uh, Hold on. Yeah, if you don't mind staying with us a few minutes and talking a little bit, because this is one of those conversations that honestly, I I love. I I could be sitting, I wish we were sitting down somewhere. (laughs) literally over yeah. a glass of wine and some meat and cheese and, and doing this yeah, because, yeah. because I could see it. I'm there. Uh, right? And I could see this us doing this um, all over. Uh, but folks, get the book. It's on Amazon. Again, it's called Dogs Don't Bark at Parked Cars. One of the things uh, that you said in your book, and this is a story that you related, it was a personal story, and I related to it and I was uh, trying to hold back tears as I'm on, as I'm, you know, doing what I do because the same thing happened with me and my dad and my dad didn't know where I mean here I go to college and everything and he's not sure what I'm doing I'm pretty sure he was hoping I would get a business management degree or be an right. attorney or a you know a doctor or something and instead I went into psychology and then went to grad school in psychology and and you know there's really no money in my field uh, so uh, and then, of course, you know, I stumbled around. I taught, taught some college at universities and things like that. And then mm-hmm. it, was, it was literally nine months before my dad died. And I wrote my first book that was in bookstores and it was all over. And it was in every bookstore and it was in every airport and everything like that. And that was, uh, it was a very cool moment. And I wrote the, the, in the inscription of the very first book before it went out to bookstores. I said... Dad, you know, you and mom are responsible because I said it's, you know, you're, you, when you started your own little sweet shop in Fords, New Jersey, this is where this starts for me to get my own dream of wanting to do something on my own. And I, I had a phone call with my dad and it was right around his birthday when I sent him the book. And my dad was never one, you know, he come, he was born in 1931 and he, they were never one in that this is the, the, the great generation, the silent generation. And they were mm-hmm. one to be extraordinarily affectionate, stor- extraordinarily um, over the top with that type of thing. They didn't say, I love you a lot and those type of things, right? It wasn't just right. the norm. Right. And he said to me on the phone, he said, I knew you were smart. He said, but I had no idea. And I could, hmm. I could hear him choking up. Oh, my up. gosh. I could hear him choking up, right? Which I never saw my yeah. dad cry, ever. Never saw my dad yeah. cry, ever. Yeah. I even heard yeah. it. And uh, here here I am, this giant of a man on the other end, trying to keep myself composed, right? Because I'm like trying to keep myself together here. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I read your story about your dad pulling you out to the front porch. And, yeah. and how... I think people need to know that we need to have those blessings in our life. We need to bless other people. I think to me, I think that was the point that really resonated home with is that we are so locked into ourselves 
And even if it's not your own child, we have the power to bring out some amazing things in others. At least this is what I gathered from it by just well, blessing them. Well, Jay, it's, it's like you're telling my story and I'm probably when you were reading that in the book, you know, you felt like I was telling your story because we both grew up with fathers. You know, my, you know, my dad was about you know, 12 years older than your dad, you know, grew up in that depression era, spent his youth, um, fighting a world war, you know, on the other side of the world. And, uh, and then, you know, got done with that and it was raising a family and it was pursuing his career. And, 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 you know, dad, dad was remarkable in, in every respect. Um, but, uh, boy, uh, you know, like you, <laughs> my dad, my dad was a Navy guy, became an engineer, worked at NASA, you know, was hoping, you know, I would go off to MIT or <laughs> I would, I would be a medical doctor that, that would have been, you know, one of those two things would have, would have meant so much to him. And instead, you know, first I went off and I, I wanted to major in art. Um, and, and I had, you know, talent in that arena. And, and then, you know, I don't know if it was better or worse Then I became a pastor, you know, and it was like, you know, he, he, you know, he was a believer himself, but it was like, he, he could never wrap his head around, around that. And, you know, I was, well, I, I was, I was close to 50 or maybe I was 50. I was 50. Um, I was 50. It, yeah. I was 50. Yeah. And, and I had, and, and quite honestly, you know, what had happened is, you know, I'd had a real, you know, setback in ministry and, and it was all, it was all a vision crisis. You know, it was, it was, you know, I was, you know, saying, Hey, you know, we can, we can go this way. And, and, you know, the, the barking dog started yelping and everything like that and kind of, <laughs> kind of tanked it all. And, and so I was at a low point in my life, you know, and, and my dad, you know, pulled me aside as, as you mentioned. And he said, son, I want you to know, I could never have done the things that you have done. Mm. I, I couldn't have begun to, to accomplish what you've accomplished, to, you know, do what you do, um, in, in, you know, in, in writing and, in, in speaking and, in, and in leading, you know, he just said, I, I couldn't do it. And, um, and he had never said anything like that to me before. He was a good dad. Yep. yep. Um, he was there at my sporting events yep. and everything like that. Yep. You know, it would cheer if, if I if I did the right thing. Was quick to point out if I, you know, had a bad attitude or something like that. But but it was never it's never that demonstrative affirmation. And and what you're describing, I believe, at least in my vernacular, is a blessing. Oh gosh! And and you know it's it's you know when when uh, again in my theological grid when God made man, first thing He did was bless him. When He called Abraham, He blessed him. You know, and and what what did His sons covet more than anything? They coveted that blessing. You know, two brothers almost killed each other over the blessing. You know, and then Moses comes along and he pronounces his blessing over all these people. And Jesus, you know, when he was ascending into heaven, he blessed his disciples. You know, it's it's this fundamental need we have as human beings to be affirmed, not for what we do, but for who we are. Oh, wow. And and every and everything that we do flows out of the essence of that, of who we are. And, and a lot of things that we do is to try to earn that blessing, but you can't earn it. Mm. You don't deserve it. Mm. It's a gift. And if it's not a gift, you know, it, 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 if you've earned it, then it's a wage, you know, <laughs> it's a check, right. you know, I've earned this thing, but, but if it's, if it's there, you know, flowing out of, you know, the essence of who somebody is and affirming the essence of who you are, it's, it's like nothing else. And we all need it. I, I've tried to do it. You know, I've got three grown sons and I still try to do that with them on a regular basis. And, you know, I try to do it with my grandchildren and my daughter-in-laws and my wife just, you know, 
affirm them for who they are. Affirm them for who they are as people, not what they do. I like what they do. I appreciate what they do. But but we all need to be affirmed for who we are. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, oh, my gosh. I, folks, did you listen to that? Did you listen to that? Did you listen to that statement? Affirm people for who they are. I cannot think of a better leadership tool. Affirm your people for who they are, not what they do. So yeah. you've got, if we can learn to do that, do you know what kind of leaders we would be is if we affirm people for who they are instead of, instead yeah. of always focused on what they do? I mean, what, how powerful. Well, and Jay, don't you, don't you know, I mean, you're the psychologist, not me, but don't you know that every single human being is hungering for that? I mean, I I look back and, and I remember a driver's ed teacher that I had in the 10th grade. I had this guy for one semester and he stands out in my mind because he took the time to show a personal interest in me to ask me about myself and and to you know give words of, of affirmation uh, in my life and and you know isn't it amazing I mean after all these years I still remember him it, it, uh, and uh, it. and and you know you know here, here's a here's something that you probably already know our word eulogy comes from a Greek word, oulogeo. It means good words. It's it's translated blessing in our English Bibles. But the word is eulogy, and we usually wait until somebody dies, or, you know, before we stand up and say, you know, this person was really a great person. You know, we, we need to speak eulogies over our wives and over our children and over our, our, our business associates and our friends every chance we get. Don't wait till they die to do it. Um, you know, then it's too late. What, what benefit will they reap from a blessing that's spoken over them after they're gone? I, you know, you know? I, I could not agree with you more. Matter of fact, my mom, who's 85, she's still around. She um, had surgery. And, you know, when they ever there's like bladder surgery and they move a tumor, you just don't know. Right. Yeah, sure. So, sure. My wife said, why don't you fly out right away? And I said, OK. So I flew out and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say all the things that I mm. want, need to say so that I don't leave anything on the table. And I said, even if she lives another 10 years, I've said them and she's heard them. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And I thanked her for every gift of that she gave me. And I, I literally, I went, it would be every day I would go in and, and spend three hours with her. And every day I would go in and I would say, mom, do you remember all the times you played Scrabble? And we thought it was just a game. <laughs> And I said, yeah. you made me, you let me as a little boy hold the dictionary and look up my words. And I said, I wrote a book. <laughs> and now I wrote three more. And I said, had you not, had you not made me play Scrabble with the dictionary, I probably wouldn't have had the words. Uh, I wouldn't have had wow. the vocabulary to do that. I said, you did that. And I said, do you remember when you made $20 calling every person up in the phone and asking them in our little town of 119 people in Nebraska, if somebody, if they had tea with somebody or something like that, and you were a correspondent for the little newspaper, I said, and you were, <laughs> and I said, you were, you were writing your column. I said, I wrote articles in entrepreneur magazine. I said, you, you gave me that. Yeah. And, and, and so every day I would come in with something that I wanted, I wanted to tell her more than I just love you. I wanted to tell her more that she was an awesome mom. I wanted to give her prime examples of mm-hmm. what she, what she blessed me with. Yeah. Right. And I, and because I, and because, and can I tell you something and folks, I hope I'm relating this story because I want to encourage you to do this because this is exactly what Eric's talking about. Don't wait. But do you just, just, why are you waiting? Why are you waiting for the funeral? There's, 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 there's no reason to wait for the funeral. It's okay. I don't care if they're not going to die 40 years from now. There's nothing wrong with telling people that you love or you respect or you care about that. You know what? This is what you did. This is, this is how you, this is how you've impacted my life. Mike Holmes, Dr. Mike Holmes, who was my advisor as an undergraduate, you blessed me by taking me under your wing and, and because you knew that I wanted to take psychology and apply it to the world and help the world be a better place. Not just, 
I didn't want to do it in an office one at a time. I wanted to make the world a better place by encouraging people to be better, and you encouraged that in me. Wow. And so um, I, I love that, and I, and I read that over and over and over again. I highlighted it, and I was like, this is this is where I, this is the world I want to live in. These are the leaders I want to follow. Mm-hmm. This is the type of leader I want to be, ultimately. And yeah. Well, you know, when you think about Jay impacting the world, I mean, what do we want to be? Well, we want to be a blessing. And and how does that start? You know, maybe for some of us, it starts by coming up with some you know, revolutionary, disruptive technology. But for most of us, it, it starts by, you know, touching one person and and making their life different. And and look, you know, what, what Jay is saying here, it doesn't have to be your dad or your mom or your brother or your sister or your aunt or uncle or, or your coach back in high school. Man, it can be the checkout girl mm. at the grocery store today. Mm who you just say, Hey, I want you to know that you do such an incredible job. And, and, you know, I was feeling down today, but when I came in and I saw you working hard and, and it just, you, you, you've, you've given me a better day. You don't know what that means to that person. You don't know what they're going through. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. they, they might've come from the hospital where their kids getting treatment for cancer or something. It's, you know? it's, oh, it's so true. It's so it's so true. What is it? What is it? There's something. There's a. I think there's a piece. Uh, there's a verse that says something about when you help those who are below. Sometimes we are entertaining angels, and we may not even know it. And, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, man, I just, I just, I, I started thinking about that. You know. You know, sometimes what happens is we just bypass the 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 person at the checkout counter, whether they're a student or an older person, or, you know, the person who is just you know behind the desk they're the the administrative person who takes phone calls and and you know you know instead of saying hey how are you and man thank you so much for having a smile on your face when i walked in here because i got to tell you something i needed a smile and (laughs) and 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 i appreciate you looking at me and smiling at me and we you know go to a doctor's office and they're so busy and you know thank you for being so efficient thank you for you know taking making sure that my case was taken care of i i am so grateful for that it's just little things and i think we think it's got to be something so big but it's not it's these words of affirmation that are so powerful that can encourage us to move even one small step oh absolutely absolutely and if we can Mention in your show, you know, who have you spoken words of affirmation to you know, this that. week, you know, or today? Um, because we, we got to be reminded of it, and um, uh, we we. Uh oh. Something that she does. It's just like a gift she has. That that she you know, affirms the, the littlest thing and everybody, it's like, it's like a, a, you know, it's like a little trail of joy that follows her around the office because she's, she's, you know, giving folks, you know, a cup of water, you know, sometimes in a, in a dry desert and, and that's what it is, you know, and, and, you know, according to my Bible, you, you get a reward for that. You, know? right, right. you give those little cups of water and that, that, that can have meaning. And, and most of the time that's what it is. It's, it's words, you know, and, and, and those words, you know, they can kill or they can make alive. Mm. And, uh, and, and I want to have words that, that make alive, uh, and, and lift people up and, and help them believe they can be and they should be and they will be. Um, and, and, and you, you have that ability as well. And, you know, Jay and your whole audience and Jay, I know that that's what you're doing in your program. I, I knew it, the, you know, the moment, you know, I heard, you know, the title of, of your, your broadcast. Um, so, you know, here's to you for, for doing that and doing it well and uh, doing it with passion as well as, as obvious intellect and, uh, and expertise. So, you know, kudos to you, man. Thank you. And so I, I've kept you over an hour. 
So, and I'm so <laughs> I didn't even realize it, but you're right. <laughs> People were probably banging on my door going, when is he going to come out? <laughs> I'm so sorry. But I want to tell you. Oh, I, no, it's all right. I've, I've so enjoyed this conversation. I know my listeners have too. And, um, you know, I'm grateful to them. And I'm, of course, grateful to James Lowe, Jiggy Jaguar, as part of the Jiggy Jaguar experience, who who pushed me into this and, and helped me embark on this part of it. And because uh, without his uh, push and his encouragement and affirmation saying, you need to do this because you're, because I was doing his show with him, co-hosting his show. And he said, you need to do something on your own. And uh, we, cause we were doing an author to author segment and we're just having a great time. And so I'm grateful to him to do this. So here's what I'd like to do. I want to ask you one last question. Okay. And this is the last question. I'm going to let you go so that you can do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> uh, and then I, and then uh, we're going to, I'm going to find you uh, and we're going to chat because I've got your email and so okay. we'll chat later okay, and good, then we'll get good. connected up in social media or whatever. So if you could give my folks something to help them find a new direction and you want, and we've done a bunch of things, but if you could, if you were to say, I'm going to sum this all up with with something and i know this is an asking you a huge task but if you could give them something what would eric write author of the book dogs don't bark at parked cars your gps in an era of hyper change what would you give them you know this this is this is something i ran across you know quite a while ago but i i heard a psychologist say one time that when we're faced with a situation, that situation is interpreted by our beliefs, and our beliefs trigger thoughts to interpret and to try to try to understand that. And those thoughts produce emotions, and those emotions ultimately drive our actions. So if you want to change your direction, you got to start with your mindsets. You got to start with your belief system. And if you're not getting where you want to go, if you, if you're not if you're not getting the results that you want, where you need to look first is your mindset and how you how you approach life and because that's going to that's going to trigger those emotions and those emotions are going to trigger behaviors and those behaviors are going to trigger outcomes but but if you start with outcomes and behaviors and emotions i'm not sure you'll ever achieve what you want you got to start with that belief system you got to start with those mindsets and when you can change those and and maybe just work on them one at a time you know this is this is the the j rule just one at a time just just work on one you'll see your whole life change that's beautiful eric wright author of the book dogs don't bark at parked cars thank you and i'm going to call you friend because okay, I, I hope so. I I, 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 I I never know if this is going to be how these turn out. It seems that every time I do this, I feel like I just make more friends. It's not like I mm -hmm. have professional authors, but uh, I cannot wait to, to see you. I, and I will. And I, I will come. Oh, I'm sure we will. Yeah, we'll run into each other and we will sit and 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 laugh and cry and enjoy it. But I cannot thank you enough for your time. And the extra time that you've given me today, I am blessed by it. I've been affirmed by it. And you are, I wish you just the utmost success in all that you're doing. And that. And tell Mr. Pearsall that uh, I am grateful that he allowed you to be with us and that the book is fantastic. And I still hope that the teeth marks do not show in his left cheek of his <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll mention that to him, yeah. but I'm not going to check. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to check it. So, Jay, it's been a delight. It really has. And thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing, you know, your kitchen table with me. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. And have an amazing rest of your day. Okay. You too, bro. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye. Bye and that was, that was Eric Wright, author of the book, Do Dogs Don't Bark, Bark at Park Cars. And you've been watching here on Facebook Live. And you've got to see some of the behind the scenes things as well. Folks, get the book. It's on Amazon. Again, it's called Dogs Don't Bark at Park Cars. It's a great book. It's great for leadership and entrepreneurship. I want to thank you all for watching this extra time. We've had a great time together. When you lost your confidence and the answers don't make sense. 
got to keep your hope alive. You got to know you can survive. This is your time to find a new direction, a brand new day, a new direction. Things are gonna change. You can find the strength to go a different way. Your dreams will take you places you have never been before. Find your passion, find your strength.